Hello, I'm Casey Barnett from the Pueblo City County Library District, and I'd like to welcome you to this special live stream presentation with Dr. Toshia Weta, Associate Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Denver. Dr. Weta will explain the scientific significance of the James Webb Space Telescope and will answer your questions about the telescope. Thank you, Dr. Weta. Hello. Okay, so am I on? Yes, I'm on. Hi, everyone. I'm Toshia Weta and, and uh, Casey. Thank you for your introduction. So I'm an um, astronomer at the University of Denver and an associate professor. And then today, um, I would like to talk to you all about this uh, James Webb Space Telescope that is going to be launched in uh, about two weeks uh, or three weeks. And then so uh, let's uh, begin. And hopefully everyone can hear me, all right. Okay, so today, um, so I would like to talk about this uh, uh, space telescope, James Webb, that, that you can see in the back of my uh, screen here. And then uh, this is a space telescope, and then this telescope is going to be using this infrared light uh, to see the universe. And I'd like to explain uh, a bit about this telescope, and then here is uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, I'd like to just briefly introduce this telescope first, and then talk about uh, what is it that, that this telescope is looking at, and then uh, talk about uh, the telescope with a bit more uh, details, and also uh, explain what kind of things we can learn by using this telescope. All right. So first, uh, I'd like to introduce this uh, James Webb Telescope. And this telescope is, again, uh, is a space telescope, but it is not the first uh, space telescope that the astronomers are going to have. Um, as some of you may know, uh, NASA started launching this space telescope back in 1990s. And the first one was this uh, Hubble Space Telescope that uh, uh, some of you may know. Uh, let me use my pointer here. Okay, so this is a Hubble, right? And then that was launched in 1990. And then uh, this telescope uses uh, a visible light and uh, ultraviolet and an infrared to look at the universe. And then uh, uh, 1999, uh, NASA launches Chandra uh, telescope. This is a telescope that uh, uses X-ray uh, to look at the universe. And then Hubble and Chandra are still uh, operational today. And then there's another one, uh, Spitzer Space Telescope, this one. This one was launched in 2003 and then was operational until last year. And then this telescope was using uh, infrared light uh, to look at the universe. And then these are not the only space telescopes that uh, we had, or astronomers had in the past. Uh, there are a lot, many more uh, space telescopes, but these are the major ones that NASA launched since the 1990s, right? And then, uh, so why do we want to send uh, all these uh, telescopes up in the sky, up in space? And then for that, I'd like to explain, I have to explain a bit about light and then wavelengths and then the spectrum. So the uh, when we so when astronomers want to look at the universe by using uh, using these telescopes, and then when we think of you know seeing, uh, we tend to think of the visible light that we can see with our eyes, right? So then, but uh, this uh, visible light is just a tiny, tiny fraction of the entire uh, what we call spectrum of light, and so. Uh, visible wavelengths is kind of in the middle of this whole spectrum. And then uh, you can go to a shorter wavelengths and then a longer wavelength side, and even go beyond uh, what we can see with our eyes. And then uh, we can, using these different kinds of light, uh, we can study different things about uh, what we are looking at. So that's why we want to send different telescopes. And especially because uh, we don't have a technology that is sensitive to the entire spectrum. So we have to have a technology that is sensitive to visible. And we have a technology that is sensitive to uh, ultraviolet. And we have a technology that is sensitive to X-ray and infrared. So we can build 
a telescope that is very specific to a certain uh, wavelength. And then we can launch that and then we can study that uh, wavelength. Uh, but then in order to study uh, universe using different wavelengths, we have to have different instruments and then these instruments have to be sent uh, to space. And that's why we have to have a number of uh, space telescopes. Right. And then also uh, the reason why we have to send uh, telescopes to space because some of you may think that, oh, we can just build telescopes on the ground and then observe things from the ground, right? That's easier. And then that's certainly true, but uh, this diagram helps you to explain that. So, so we have these uh, different wavelengths. Right? So here is the shorter side, uh, gamma ray, X-ray, ultraviolet, and then visible is this range here, and then infrared, and then uh, also microwave and radio. So it's a longer wavelength side. And this diagram is uh, showing you uh, how much uh, light uh, is coming through the atmosphere of the Earth. And as you see here, the visible light can penetrate through the atmosphere and then can come to the ground. So we can build uh, telescopes in, in, in the visible and then observe the universe. And also radio wavelengths here radio waves can come through the atmosphere and then can come to the ground. So we can build lots of radio dishes and then to look at the universe. But other wavelengths, so like here, short outside, gamma ray, x-ray, ultraviolet, these waves, these light are absorbed by uh, the, the atmosphere of the Earth. And then much of the infrared is also absorbed. And then long, very long side of the long side of the uh, radio is also absorbed. So in order to observe the universe using these waves, these lights that is not cutting through the atmosphere to the ground, we'd have to send a probe or a telescope up in the space to uh, detect these light. So this is why we have to send some of the uh, telescopes in the sky and then in space. All right, and then now um, what can we learn by using these different uh, light? And then here uh, is the next slide. And so we can uh, look at very different uh, aspects of the, the, the object that we are looking at using different wavelengths. And so this, uh, these images that are in the back of me uh, shows this particular object called Crab Nebula. And Crab Nebula is uh, this is a, a very massive star exploded about thousand years ago and exploded and spewed up lots of things in, in the surrounding space. And that's what we are seeing today. And then uh, here we have four images uh, taken at different wavelengths. So the uh, top left is radio uh, image of this nebula. And then this one uh, upper right, this is infrared image of this nebula. And then bottom left is optical image. And then the uh, bottom right is the X-ray. And then X-ray, this one uh, shows the very uh, high energy portion of this nebula. So this is a high temperature region, very center of it. And as you see here, uh, there's some disk structure, and then uh, jets are going both ways. And then this uh, very nice structure is seen. And very, this is very ener energetic and this is very warm, very hot. And then optical also shows uh, very hot gas. And then we see that uh, the hot gas is distributed like in a filamentary uh, fashion. So it's very uh, structured. And then infrared uh, also uh, shows gas, but a little bit more uh, lower temperature. Uh, and then uh, we see that this uh, warm gas is kind of surrounding this very hot gas uh, that we see in the optical. And then radio wavelengths also shows uh, the presence of hot gas and also uh, radio shows uh, presence of very cold uh, material. And then we can sort of see that uh, the colder thing is sort of you know, surrounding everything and then so distributed a much wider expanse uh, of the nebula. So uh, by using these different light, uh, we can look at the different components of this object. And then we can study a lot about uh, this object by just using single uh, you know, wavelength range. We can on study only so much, but by using uh, many different ranges of wavelengths, we can study so much more 
than just one wavelength. So that's why uh, we want to use the whole spectrum uh, to study uh, these uh, objects in the sky, in space, and then uh, so that's why we want to send lots of uh, space telescopes up in the sky. Okay, then now uh, I'd like to uh, jump into this next topic. And then this uh, James Webb is going to be using infrared. And then, uh, so what do we learn uh, by using infrared? Okay, so then here we have some photos that are uh, taken in the optical, right? Not astronomical object, but uh, some familiar things that uh, you might see in the zoo. Right? So left image, uh, we see some uh, meerkats. And then on the right, we have a crocodile. And so these are just the uh, usual uh, photos taken in the visible light. And then we can see lots of details. Uh, you know, the you know, meerkats are very furry, and then a uh, crocodile is kind of wet, and then, you know, smooth skin, and then color is like there's, a, you know, uh, like a striping, you know, marks, and then so forth. So in the visible, we can see lots of details about these animals, right? Now, how do they appear in the infrared? If what, how do they appear if we look at them in the infrared? Do you know? Right. Some of you may have seen these, you know, infrared uh, pictures or uh, infrared movies. But then, if we look at them in infrared, this is how they appear. Right. right. So it's just toggle back and forth. Right. So this is visible, uh, this is infrared. Uh, so infrared is uh, detecting the, the warmth of these animals, the temperature, essentially the body temperature is measured by uh, the web, uh, the infrared. Right. So let me scoot myself a little bit. So the, uh, you know, of course, infrared, we cannot see infrared with our eyes. So we can sort of give, you know, giving this color to the uh, infrared wavelength so that we can see. But then, so this uh, very uh, bright color is uh, like this here, the temperature is shown here, so 100 uh, degrees. And then this uh, black is like 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's uh, the color scheme that you see. So you see that the meerkat is very, very warm, right? very warm. And then crocodile, right? it's a reptile and it's a cold blooded animal. So um, it's very, uh, relatively speaking, colder than meerkats. And then we see that in this, uh, so the crocodile is not growing as much as the meerkats here. But by looking at uh, these things in the infrared, we can see that the body temperature is very different. That is something that we cannot see by looking at them in the visible, right? In the visible, we can sort of see, you know, how they look like, you know, their skin and skin tone and things like that. And then, but uh, we cannot tell the body temperature by looking at them in, in, the, in the visible. But by looking at them in the infrared, we can tell uh, the body temperature differences. So this is the kind of thing that uh, we like to do to use different wavelengths to study things that we want to look at. Okay, so then going back to the spectrum. So um, this is the whole spectrum here, and I guess the shorter side here, and then longer side here, and then visible is just this bit, and then uh, we have some uh, expanded here, and then we have a Hubble, taking care of the visible side. And then we used to have these Spitzer space telescopes taking care of the uh, mid infrared to uh, far infrared range. So this region here in between was kind of uh, missed. So then that's why uh, now we are launching this James Webb to uh, observe the universe in this wavelength range between the visible and uh, mid infrared. And so then uh, James Webb will take care of this near infrared to uh, medium infrared range of the spectrum. And then, what do we uh, are we going to be learning uh, by using again? Uh, infrared is good at uh, measuring the temperature of something that is warm, like hundred degrees Fahrenheit, right? And that's what we are going to be doing. So this is one example. Um, so uh, these, these images are showing the same thing. This is Eagle Nebula. 
And then so uh, some of you may be familiar with this picture. So this picture uh, is uh, the picture that is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And so we see that, uh, so this, what this is, is that, uh, uh, so the dark region is uh, where there is a very dense gas, very cold, dense gas. Uh, and then uh, now in this dense gas, uh, stars are being born, the stars are forming. And then some of the forming stars are kind of uh, peaking here at the edge of this uh, dark region. And then the, the light that is uh, coming from newly born stars are kind of seeping through uh, this thick material. And that's what we are seeing. And then uh, if we look at this the same region in the near infrared, we are kind of uh, able to see through this very thick uh, gas and then so now in this near-infrared picture, uh, lots of background stars are visible in this dark region that is dark in the uh, optical, uh, in the visible. So in this uh, visible picture, it's just dark. And we don't see much. But in near-infrared, we are kind of uh, seeing through this uh, thick gas. And then now lots of uh, background objects are kind of visible now. And then if we go even beyond uh, near infrared and go to mid infrared region, this whole region looks very different. Now we are, uh, uh, what we are detecting is this warmth of this dense gas. So the gas itself is now emitting this uh, infrared light. And that is what we are detecting. So now we can directly study this warm gas uh, by using mid infrared. So again, by using different wavelengths of light, uh, we are looking at the same thing, but very different aspects of the same thing. And then we have the whole uh, picture of whatever we are studying. So this is essentially uh, what we are going to do, uh, you know, what we can do uh, with these telescopes in general. So then now uh, let me shift gears and then talk about uh, talk more about this telescope, James Webb. So again, here on my back, I, so this, uh, well, this is of course a picture of it. You know, it's it's not real thing. Then again, so here's again the telescopes. Um, the telescope. So this is the top side. So we have a mirror here, and then. Uh, this is unique because if you think of a telescope, you expect kind of like a tube thing, right? And then that's what the telescope is for most of us. But uh, this uh, James Webb does have this tube. And that's because we are going to send it to space and then um, it's dark. And then so you don't have to have this tube to block the light coming from the side. Right? So it's always light is coming in and then gets reflect, reflected off from, by the mirror. And then there is a secondary mirror to reflect light back in. And then, uh, then signal is coming into the middle and then going to be sent to the other side of the uh, telescope. Right, so here we have the sun shield. And there are five layers of sun shield. And then uh, the back side is, looks like this. And so then uh, here is uh, where all the instruments are located. Right? So again, uh, you know, the light coming in gets reflected, reflected off by the mirror, and then going to the secondary, gets reflected off, and then going to the center. And then uh, there is a tertiary mirror, the third mirror, to reflect light uh, back to the uh, back side of the telescope, and then light gets, gets sent to this uh, instrument. Uh, side, right, back side of the telescope. Okay. So this is uh, essentially uh, how this whole thing looks like. Right? And then this mirror, right, how big this is, so that you might wonder how big this is. And then, so this is the uh, picture and the comparison. So here is the web, uh, the whole mirror. And then here we have a mirror for the Hubble Space Telescope. And then here is the human size. Right? So that's the how big uh, the mirror of the James Webb. And also, if, if you, uh, you, you notice that uh, uh, the mirror of the James Webb is not just the one mirror. Uh, the James Webb mirror consists of these lots of lots of smaller hexagon mirrors, and they uh, walk 
together as the as a single mirror uh, and then that's the difference so the hubble is just one mirror uh, about a human size but then uh, james webb is about three times as large as the um the hubble and then uh it's it's called segmented mirror and then uh, there are many uh, segmented mirrors uh, to work together uh, to focus light into the instrument and this is so big right so then how do we launch this because we cannot launch this as is because it's so big and then then the launch is uh, done by a rocket and then so this whole thing has to be stored in the fuselage of a rocket and then uh, they are folded down like this so here are some pictures uh, being assembled and then we see the whole mirror uh, assembled and then we see the person here so you can see how big this is compared with the human right and then uh, this whole mirror is folded up like this so the sides are kind of folded like this and then uh, and then of course sun shield is uh, you know, squished down and then everything is put together in the compact uh, like this and then uh, set in the fuselage to launch right so what that means is that when this is launched everything has to be deployed the solar uh, the sun shield has to be uh, deployed and then the mirror has to be unfolded and then uh, you know uh, made in this shape in space and so this is uh, so this sequence is showing the next slide here so it's going to be like this so uh, this the folded uh, James Webb is going to be launched and then out of fuselage now and then now sun shield uh, gets deployed and then tested and then now the mirror is uh, unfolded like this and then uh, then everything gets tested and now and then in the operation mode like this so this whole sequence has to go smoothly uh, in space so that uh, astronomers can use uh, this telescope Right. And then the other question is where this telescope is going to go. So we say just the space, but it's not anywhere in space. It has to go very specific location. Uh, and then this is where uh, the James Webb is going to go. So here we have the sun and here the earth and the moon. So earth is going around the sun like this. And then there is uh, the the james webb is going to be sent to this uh, point called lagrange 2 and this is a point where uh, the gravity from the sun and the gravity from the earth is balanced and then uh, james webb is not going to be sitting at that point but then uh, james webb is going to be going around uh, this lagrange 2 point and then this is uh, the reason is that uh, this is an infrared telescope remember and the infrared uh, we are uh, trying to measure the warmth of whatever we point a telescope at and then you can easily imagine uh, in this situation the sun is very warm and then the earth is very warm and then even the telescope itself is warm right? and that's why uh, the telescope cannot point to the sun you cannot do that and then even at, uh, the the sunlight uh, cannot go into the uh, mirror and that's why uh, the sun shield is deployed like this and then uh, going back to the few pages back let's see so remember this is how everything is uh, designed so in this configuration, in this uh, orientation, the sun is back down here, right? So then the sunlight is all blocked by the sun shield. And then remember the instrument is on the uh, sun shield side and this is because the instrument itself is warm. So if instrument is on this side, right, the mirror side, the instrument itself is going to affect the telescope. Right? So this 
warmth from the uh, the instrument is going to go into the mirror and then go into the instrument itself. So instrument is looking at the instrument warmth itself. So that's not going to work. So that's why we have to have the even instrument on the other side to uh, so in, so the so that any heat is not going to go to the other side. So that's the uh, reason why uh, we put uh, James Webb far back in this side. So the, uh, the sunlight is usually blocked by the earth. And also there's a sun shield. So and then uh, no warmth is going to be going to the uh, instrument or the, the, the mirror side of the telescope. So this is why uh, the uh, James Webb is going to be sent to this location away from the sun and then pointing away from the sun all the time all right so then now if we have a telescope here so how do we communicate with it and there's a lots of uh, efforts uh, putting into this and we have a deep uh, space network and then uh, here's essentially how uh, the operation is going to go so uh, the Headquarter is in Baltimore here, right? So this is the uh, shot of the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. And then uh, there are some uh, stations across the US. And then uh, essentially most of the communication uh, is uh, sent from this uh, radio dish in California. And then uh, the signal gets sent to uh, the telescope and then telescope does uh, whatever we command to do so it gets pointed to the target and then do observations as we design and then take the data and then data gets sent back to this uh, dish and then from this uh, station then the data gets sent back to the headquarter and then we co uh, collect data and then store the data and also then next set of commands will be sent uh, through this dish and then to the telescope and so on, uh, so on. So this is how the operation is going to go. Right. And then um, this uh, James Webb is not just US effort, and then this is a collaboration with European Space Agency and also Canadian Space Agency. And then uh, you see these white dots all across the US and Canada, and then all across Europe. So these dots uh, institutions and then research centers that are participating in this uh, James Webb project. So it's a very uh, world effort, is international collaboration. Now, so it's uh, about telescope, and then let's now uh, shift gears to the last bit, and then let's talk about what we can do with this telescope. So this uh, James Webb has four uh, main themes of study, and these are these four. So the early universe. So we want to study how universe uh, got started and then how universe evolved uh, you know, very early on in the history of the universe. That's what we want to study with uh, James Webb. And also, uh, we want to study how galaxies evolved over time. So after universe got started and stars are born and then stars assembled into galaxies, but we don't really know how this all whole uh, procedure uh, happened and the assembly of the universe happened very early on in the universe. So that's, uh, that's what we want to study uh, by using James Webb. And also here, uh, we'd like to understand how uh, stars are born and how they you know, how they evolve, how they age, and how they die, and then how they uh, go back into uh, the interstellar medium and then uh, form to, uh, next generation of stars and this whole cycle of uh, life cycle of stars and then material that uh, we see in the universe today. Uh, this is also uh, evolution of the universe, how uh, material. And then, you know, things like us, you know, how uh, we came out to be. That's what we want to study uh, by using uh, James Webb. And then the other thing, the last thing, but not least. Uh, so this is uh, the latest development. We are finding lots of lots of uh, planets in uh, star systems elsewhere. Right? 
and then uh, we would like to find uh, cousins of the Earth, you know, elsewhere in, in the universe, and then James Webb will be helping us to uh, characterize these uh, planets in, uh, elsewhere in the universe. So that's the uh, other thing that the James Webb is going to be studying. Okay. All right. So let's look at each one of these a little bit more uh, closely. So, um, so this early universe. So we would like to use uh, James Webb to see as far back in time as possible, or as far uh, as possible. Right. And then uh, if you remember um, this slide here, right? so in the visible, uh, our view is usually blocked if there is something that is very uh, dense. So you know, here we have a very dense uh, gas here. So uh, visible light cannot penetrate through uh, dense gas. But if we use infrared, then uh, infrared light can penetrate through the, even these uh, thick, uh, thick, dense gas. So if we use uh, James Webb, we can sort of peer through the universe, even uh, these uh, dense gases. Right? So that, what that means is that we can see far, far away uh, in the universe. So and then um, and then seeing far away in astronomy means long time past in the history, and that is because even light takes time to travel. Right? And then also the universe is known to be expanding, so when light travels across this expanding universe, the light wave kind of gets stretched. And then stretched means that uh, the light that is uh, each, uh, emitted by our target gets stretched as they travel, and then they get more longer and longer when, uh, when they uh, get to us. So that's why we use infrared, uh, so that's a longer wavelength uh, light to detect such uh, object that is far, far away. Right? And then by doing this, so by looking at all these uh, farthest you know, uh, galaxies possible, then uh, we would like to have this uh, snapshot of a galaxy at different time in the past. And so here uh, we have these uh, different uh, images of a galaxy. And then this is sort of familiar view of a galaxy in, in the optical. So this is a nice spiral galaxy. So this is a galaxy that is kind of near to us. So this is the galaxy uh, that uh, uh, that we see at the current uh, age of the universe. But if we look at the far away, that means that the, the galaxies that we detect at that far away is the, the galaxy that existed back far back in time right, when the universe was much younger. So then this uh, galaxy here is a galaxy uh, that existed 10 billion, 13 billion years ago. And then now by looking at all these different uh, galaxies at the different distances, so we are kind of seeing uh, how a galaxy evolved over time. Right? So this is like very recent, uh, so this is, uh, 13 billion years after the universe got started. So this is like uh, 1 billion years after and then in between. So we can see the snapshots of uh, galaxies at different epochs of time. And then we can see how a galaxy evolved over time. So this is one thing that uh, have, uh, the, the James Webb can do. And here again, uh, because the infrared light can penetrate through uh, thick gas. So we can again go back to these star forming regions uh, having lots of dense gas. And then we want to see through these gases. And then we want to look at uh, stars that are being born, for example. Right. And also, uh, these images are nice. You can always see beautiful images. And then we can see how things are distributed. Uh, but also we can do what we call spectroscopy, and that is uh, a way to determine what kind of material exists in space. 
then um, we can do this for uh, these planets that we find in uh, other uh, stellar systems. And so this is an example. So this is a spectrum of the atmosphere of the Earth. And then here we see different uh, gases detected. So these wiggles uh, tells us, tells astronomers uh, what kind of material exists in the atmosphere. So here we have like oxygen here and then oxygen some other places. And this is oxygen too. And then I think oxygen exists right here. So these wiggles tell us uh, oxygen exists in the uh, atmosphere of the Earth and also the other things like water vapor and then carbon dioxide. And this is an example of the Earth. And then we can do this kind of thing for planets elsewhere in space. And then if we detect oxygen, and then that is going to be like the Earth. And then we might expect that the something like us may exist in such a place. So uh, this spectroscopy and then knowing what kind of material is uh, out there, uh, knowing about that is very, very helpful for us to understand uh, the characteristics of these uh, exoplanets. And so this is another thing uh, that uh, we are going to be doing, right? So I think I've run out of time and then this is uh, the end of my talk. And then uh, thank you for your attention. And then I can um, entertain some questions if you have some. Thank you so much, Dr. Weta. That was so interesting. And I learned so much from your presentation. Um, and did you have some questions from that were submitted that you'd like to share with Dr. Oh, Walker? yes, actually, I have an answer sheet for some of the questions. So if I can go to these slides. Sure, okay. yeah, okay, yeah, so, go ahead. And then uh, I think some of the questions are answered during my talk. And so I have some questions that uh, wasn't particularly part of my talk in here. But then uh, after that, I can answer any of the questions you may uh, have. Right. So then uh, the first question that uh, was this, uh, how many stars in the galaxy? Right. That was uh, one question. And then uh, here we have uh, these images. So this, this image is the Milky Way uh, taken at very different wavelengths. And then uh, here, uh, this side, uh, this one, is the Milky Way that is seen in the optical. Right? So then the galaxy itself, the galactic disk, uh, there's lots of gas. So we are not seeing through the disk. And that's why we have lots of dark uh, lesions here, the dark lane. So that's the uh, galactic plane. But if we look at the galactic plane, other wavelengths, we can see a whole lot more. And then we know that uh, the gas is you know, existing in the galactic plane. And then going back to the question, so uh, how many uh, stars in the galaxy? Actually, we don't know for sure because of this reason. In the visible, we cannot see through the entire galaxy by using uh, the visible. And then we have not not uh, accounted for every single one of these stars that may exist in the, in the Milky Way. But we have a good estimate. And then good estimate is that about several uh, hundred billion, uh, that, that, that's how many uh, stars are in the, in the Milky Way galaxy. Okay. And the next question uh, is, uh, what is a light year? And then some of you may think of this as a time, but it's not. The light year is a length. And then this is the length uh, over which light can travel in a year. And so that's how long light year is. And then light year is about six trillion miles. Right? And then that's about 9.5 trillion kilometers. And so that's how long light can travel in a year. And then, uh, so, you know, six trillion miles is uh, too big a number to kind of uh, imagine. So I can tell you this. So the sun, sun is eight light minutes away. What that means is that it light leaves the sun and it takes eight minutes to get to us. So if we look up now and then look at the sun, 
And then we think that we are looking at the sun right now, but it's not. The sun that we are seeing right now is the sun eight minutes ago because it takes eight minutes for the light to leave the sun and then come to us. So we are always looking at the sun eight minutes in the past. And by, again, the original question was, what is the light year? And the light year is the length. And then that's how much light can travel in a year. And then that's about uh, six trillion miles. Okay. The next question, uh, let's see, is how long does a star live? And that's also a good question. And then it's a difficult question to answer because it also depends on the mass of the star. Because uh, stars come in different masses. And then so the, the heavier ones uh, sh uh, live only short amount of time and then lighter stars can live very long time. And then uh, the sun, uh, and then um, also uh, the whole life of star, uh, very, uh, there are very different stages of the life of stars. And then this diagram shows uh, the evolution of stars. And so here stars are born here and then massive stars evolve this way and eventually they explode. And then stars like the sun, uh, they stay like the sun for a long time, but eventually they get uh, swelled up and then spew up lots of things and then kind of cools down and then cools off, but they don't explode. Right? Uh, so this, uh, the stage called main sequence is, this is kind of uh, the stable stage. And then, um, so this is the mainly stars spend their lives on. And then the sun is expected to spend 10 billion years in this phase. And then 10 billion years is pretty much the uh, lifetime of the sun. And then we think that the, the sun still has 5 billion years to go. So it's in the middle of uh, the lifetime. So then again, so the sun, stars like the sun, they live about 10 billion years. And then um, heavier stars will live much shorter and then uh, lighter stars will live much longer than that. Okay, and the next question uh, is how big is a star? And this is also uh, uh, you know, dependent on how massive a star is. And the massive stars will, we have lots of stuff, so then takes up much space, so it's larger, so that's like that. And then we have uh, this picture, so then uh, the relative size kind of shows the relative differences. And then I believe the sun is somewhere around here, it's a tiny dot then you can even see the sun in this uh, diagram here. And then there are lots of lots of other stars that are so much larger than the sun. And then uh, the largest stars, I th we are thinking that the, they are like thousand times bigger than the sun. And then the smallest uh, stars, uh, they are like one hundredth of uh, the sun. That's what we think. So there's a variety of sizes. Uh, but uh, between 1,000 times larger than the sun to uh, one hundredth uh, or smaller, a right? hundred times smaller than the sun. So that's the range. Okay, so here are the slides that I prepared. So that's the end of my uh, early slide. So the next page is empty, right? So then let me go back to this. And then if you have more questions, then I'm happy to answer these questions. Yeah, Dr. Weta, um, there were some questions coming in. Okay. Um, so um, one from Mr. Saxton asked, how long does it take for the data to travel? I'm wondering if he means from like the telescope to maybe to Maryland, like you were talking about. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, the signal travels at the speed of light. So in the sense, you know, in the same sense, you know, the light from the sun takes eight minutes. Uh, you know, the James Webb is not that far. So uh, it, it doesn't take that long, but then still it takes time, yes. But I, I don't know the exact number uh, off the top of my head. I'm sorry about that, but the, well, it takes some time, yes. Be especially because uh, the James Webb is sent to that Lagrange 2 point, and that is farther away than the usual you know, uh, satellites that orbits around the Earth. So that's a good point. So it takes time, yes. Yeah, we have a couple more questions too. Um... Let's see.
from another from Miss Sexton, I think at Rye Elementary. Uh, what will happen to the parts that detach during the launch? Oh, the rocket parts. So they uh, they would they would come down and then they will most of uh, the the fuselage and stuff will be uh, burnt down upon the entry into the atmosphere. But some will uh, well some will I guess come down to the ocean and then that's that's that's, that's it. And another one, um, Mr. Hyatt asks, uh, his class is watching from North Mesa, I think. Um, let's see here. Uh, how far can the web telescope see or view? How far away? Right. So uh, it's not about the, you know, it's not the, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the power of the telescope. It's, it's about, it's, it's always about the how bright this thing is. Because if this thing is bright, then no matter how far it is, if you have a sensitive, if you have a detector that is sensitive enough to catch that light, then you can see it. But in that sense, um, so let me go back to this slide here. So this is where I was talking about uh, very, uh, looking at very far object, and then far object means you know because it takes time for the light to travel. Uh, we are looking at the very uh, old things, right? So then uh, this image here. So this is actually uh, this this image here. This is actually one of the farthest uh, uh, galaxy that we have ever uh, detected, and then this is uh, thirteen point four uh, billion years away, a billion light years away. So it's about uh, less, even less than one billion years old of the universe. So that's how far we can see at the moment. Wow, that's really far. Yes, it's very <laughs> but that's, I just, it always blows my mind that you're looking back in time, you know, right. and yes. um, and I think you might have kind of covered this, but just to make sure, also Mr. Hyatt's class asked yes. where and how it was built. Um, so, it, you know, where where was this like all assembled? Right. So, uh, okay, I should have that slide, but uh, let me go back to this slide. So, so again, this is a worldwide effort. So, different components are built by different people, and then uh, I let's see. I believe it was assembled in California, NASA Center, and then uh, and then um, the testing was uh, done there, and then and then now the uh, everything is assembled, and then the launch was done by the uh, European uh, Space Agency. So then uh, the launch vehicle is uh, this Ariane Five rocket, and then the ESA has a launch site in uh, uh, New Guinea here, right? So then uh, the launch site is South, South America here, right around there. And then there's a launch site there, and it's going to be launched from there by uh, European uh, European uh, Space Agency. But most of the uh, assembly was done in California. That's how I understood. And uh, thank you for that. Another question I thought was interesting is, what are they gonna do? Uh, I think this was from Miss Saxon's class at Rye Elementary. Uh, what are they gonna? What happens to the telescope once it stops working? Oh uh, well, that's something <laughs> that we don't want to think about. <laughs> really. And then, do um, they think it's gonna work like indefinitely, or is there kind of a lifespan on the telescope? Well, so in it? That's the, you know, this is the so the. Let me go back to that slide. The very first one. So the Hubble, right? Hubble was launched in 1990. It's still operational. And then no one at the time thought that the Hubble will survive 30 years. And it's still in operation. And then, uh, but the Hubble uh, did some hiccups, but you know, it's, it's 30 years old and 30 years in space. So, and then we can't do any space work anymore. So it's just aging and aging and aging. And then uh, Hubble is not in great shape, uh, to be honest. And then Hubble, I experienced some hiccups a couple of weeks ago and then uh, went back into a safe mode and stopped uh, observing. And then, but the NASA uh, people 
try to reselect, uh, you know, uh, do some testing and then uh, putting back the instrument one by one back online. And I think Hubble resumed uh, science operation uh, like a few days ago. So uh, when anything happens, usually a telescope goes into safe mode and then stops all the science observations and go to safe mode. And then at that time, NASA people will try to communicate with the telescope and then diagnose what's going on and then figure out uh, and then, uh, and then uh, try to come up with the mitigation and then uh, how to fix things. And then they send command and then take care of these issues and then resume uh, science operation. That's how usually uh, things go when things go wrong. But that's some, again, something that we don't want to, you know, astronomers don't want to think about too much. Yeah, and kind of on those same lines, um, Jackson was asking from Rai uh, if if there's a chance it could be damaged in space. So uh, not yes. only, I guess, the instruments have to work, but like, you know, what could happen in space to it? Well, so that's a good question. So, you know, uh, as you might, uh, some of you might have heard, you know, the uh, International Space Station there, there, you know, they were scheduled to do some space work, but the space work was postponed because there are some debris flying around the space station and then it was dangerous for the uh, astronauts to do the space work. And then similar thing can happen to uh, this James Webb. But, uh, but uh, again, going back to that slide, so James Webb is going to be launched at this L2 point and then uh, it's kind of far away uh, from uh, the Earth. So, there are, you know, I don't know how, how, how many debris are out there. Uh, and also, uh, the James Webb is not only space telescope that is going around L2 point. There are other telescopes actually already there uh, orbiting around L2 point. And I don't think they will you know, crash each other. But then, uh, of course, you, you have to think about all these other effects, you know, the uh, debris and then also some uh, whatever else that's, that's out there. Yes, yeah, so you have to be careful. And then, uh, yeah, so that is something that you have to, you know, have to keep in mind that, that something could go wrong like that, yes. Okay, thanks. And uh, there's been a lot of questions. I think you've really engaged the kids in this topic. Okay, and uh, Noah was asking, um, are there other telescopes being built? Oh, uh, you mean the space telescopes? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. uh, there are lots of one, you know, the, so let's go back to that slide. Um, Right, so here I was sort of explaining these uh, different things. And then, so the web is certainly the next one. And then these guys here, uh, these are something that we are planning. So they're being still planned. And then, uh, then some of the instruments are being built, but the telescope itself hasn't assembled yet. So there are lots of other space telescopes being planned and being built and being, uh, you know, and also there are, some people are trying to even think about what's what's going to be the next of James Webb even. All right, there's no ending in wanting to yes. explore space. And <laughs> um, that uh, one of the other questions um, from Jackson at Rye was how long did it take to build the James Webb telescope? Um, let's see. Well, so, so, you know, like, just as I said, you know, now there are already people thinking about what's next after James Webb. And then when Hubble was launched, that was essentially when people th started thinking about what's, the, what's next. So even mm, late 1990s, people started thinking about, and then um, I think the project, uh, I, I don't, I can't remember when, but then, uh, early 2000, I think that's when the plan was officially, uh, you know, started. And then originally the, uh, the James Webb was supposed to be launched 2014. That was the original plan. Now it's 2021. So, so that's how long it can take. So it can take a long time to build a space telescope like this. 
So you were saying from conception was probably back in 1990, almost till now, right? It's, you yes. know, but uh, yeah, that there's been um, working on it and thinking about it and getting it ready. Um, right. And so for a final question, I think before we end this presentation, which again, thank you so much, Dr. Weta, it was such so a great no presentation. Problem, um, how how would they test the telescope here on Earth? Ian asked from Rye Elementary. How could they test this on Earth? Yes, that's also a good question. And then I, I wish I had some pictures, but uh, you know, if you Google and then you know uh, you can see some of the NASA sites showing these uh, pictures, photos of the James Webb, and then some of the pictures I show here. So. Um, so this is uh, actual thing of being assembled. And then at the NASA center, they have this giant, uh, you know, uh, I guess container. And then uh, you, they can put the whole James Webb into this container and then they can put the vacuum, vacuum condition in this container. And then that's where they can, uh, uh, the NASA people tested the James Webb in the, under the vacuum. So they have this kind of you know, gigantic facility at NASA Center to do all this uh, space-like you know, uh, environment testing. Yes. So these tests are done before they even launch uh, the telescope and then they make sure that uh, you know, everything works. And then we hope that everything works after launch. And then that is coming up in, I think in three weeks, in a tw uh, December 22nd, I believe. Oh, yes. Thank you for mentioning that. So, yes, uh, you could still watch the launch of the James Webb Telescope. That's happening hopefully the end of December. Uh, go to nasa.gov and you'll find all the information or just Google James Webb Telescope. Um, we also have information, information on our website. Um, and just thank you so much again, Dr. Weta, uh, from for joining us from the University of Denver, uh, professor of physics and astronomy. Thank you so much for helping us better understand the James Webb Space Telescope and its scientific significance. Um, thank you to the participants, uh, the SAC, uh, Mr. and Ms. Saxton. I know Rye Elementary was here, North Mesa Elementary, um, and anybody I missed. Thank you again for uh, joining in. And uh, you can uh, also get more information at the Pueblo West and Jidon branches of the Pueblo Library. Jidon, we have we're going to have some Star Cycle uh, kits that you can make your own uh, Star Cycle bracelet. And uh, Pueblo West is going to have a constellation mural up with also some uh, NASA giveaways that we uh, got from this project. So uh, thank you for joining us and. Uh, Come back to the Pueblo Library YouTube and Facebook channels for more great programs.